I have a simple question for you, to which there is no simple answer. Why do we play games? To relax? To plunge into a fictional world and get away from the difficulties of the real world? To... To be honest, there can be an infinite number of answers. But if we talk about immersion in the game, then the ideal gaming embodiment of this desire is immersive sims, which, unfortunately, are dead? Are they dead? Do you think that the last successful immersive has been Deus Ex? But what about the complete freedom of playing and the possibility to bear in Baldur's Gate 3? So we decided to cover this topic in our new video, to yearn for one of the best ideas of the history that has gone into the background, which today is reborn and revealed again in indie games. You are watching Press X. Get comfortable and let's get started. You probably think, what are immersive sims, and if they died, what killed them? Well, if you know what immersive sims are, it's already good. Although, then, it is probably especially sad for you to realize that this genre has practically disappeared from modern computer games. If you've come across this term for the first time, it's essentially a deep immersive video game genre that focuses on player choices. Nowadays, all the features of the genre are already known, and it is very clear what should be in a good immersive simulator. This is often a detailed internal environment that reacts realistically and in different ways to the player's actions. That means, if in most games the gameplay relies on scripted scenes and events pre-planned by the developers, then the feature of immersive sims is the plot enveloping the player correctly integrated into continuous gameplay, which is essentially emergent. We will talk about this later. All this guarantees high interactivity of the game world and the possibility of various and creative ways of passing, including unplanned by the developer. However, this was not always the case. It is in the modern sense in the genre of immersive sim a player and his personal game experience is always in the first place. And 30 years ago, the genre was created from scratch from other more similar games with primitive game mechanics such as platformers, shooters, and RPGs. The developers simply wanted to give the player the ability to create their own solution to situations rather than play by script. As a result, they created a new genre. And now, we'll figure out how it all evolved and became the immersive sim that many people know from the Deus Ex games. The history of the genre dates back to 1989. Game designer Paul Neurath worked for Origin Systems in the mid-80s when Apple II computers were gaining popularity. No, not a gaming platform from Electronic Arts, but the Origin Sound and Graphics System. The studio is best known for the games in the Ultima and Wing Commander series. Given that the Apple II at that time was far from being available to everyone, and sometimes it was only possible to use it somewhere at the university, Paul, who played Ultima 1 on a floppy disk, was glad to start working as a game designer for the company. As a freelancer at Origin Studios, Paul developed space simulators, and in 1989 finished working on his first creation, Space Rogue. The game has become quite successful. And Space Rogue was my first attempt to try to do sort of a cross-genre game. Uh, where I was blending some very early 3D graphics and space flight uh, simulation with role-playing. It is not surprising because the Star Trek series was popular in those years. People dreamed of space fantasy and were amazed by the holographic room in which absolutely any environment could be created. Since then, everyone has been dreaming of the day when digital reality will be available to us. Analyzing why this happened, the developer had an idea. Why not combine the meditative fluidity of space sims with RPG games, which at the time looked nothing like Skyrim or Fallout 4 or even Baldur's Gate 3? The floppy games were 8 to 64 bits long and were either a 2D map with a moving character or first-person slides like in Ultima 1, which was played by Paul. According to him, not being an artist with an engineering background, he independently did all the visuals and game design, and in three and a half years he gained tremendous experience in the company. Origin Systems was planning a long move from New Hampshire to Texas, home of one of the studio founders. The game designer did not want to move to Texas and left the team. Paul Neurath, having gained experience, decided to form his own company, Blue Sky Productions, on royalties from the sales of Space Rogue. Besides, the appearance of a prototype of a virtual reality helmet and a glove that allows you to interact with a virtual space, in fact, really gave humanity a digital reality and the appearance of a game that would give a person a world simulation was a matter of time. Planning to take on a new project, Neareth teamed up with a young programmer, Doug Church, a graduate of the University of Massachusetts who was very interested in games, even despite the fact that Doug had not yet finished his studies. 
Working with a small team of ex-colleagues who also didn't want to move to Austin in a tiny office, they put together the first Neroth-inspired demo of the game. Paul has been an active Dungeons & Dragons player. In those years, many developers were inspired by the game, its plots, monsters, and role-playing system, thinking about how to modify it and transfer it to their products. But Paul was interested in something else. For the game designer, D&D was a world filled with the spirit of freedom and improvisation, and this is what formed the basis of his game development. The demo had no story, no gameplay, nothing more than wandering around a dungeon with the ability to turn around in three-dimensional space. Um, it was difficult to find a publisher for it. You know, there was, uh, it wasn't something that the publisher saw and said, yes, that's, that's, you know, that's going to be a successful game. It was very different from games that had been done before. Well, we, this was before Wolfenstein had come out. So when we were showing the demo, it was the first time these publishers had seen texture mapping and, and moving through a 3D environment with texture mapping, and, and I'm pretty sure we were the first folks in the games industry. The company presented its development at the Consumer Electronics Show in 1990, and the head of Origins System, Richard Garriott, liked it. He immediately offered to release Paul's game under the Ultima franchise brand. And since the game needed experienced oversight of the refinement process, Warren Spector from Origin Systems was appointed the project's producer. Yep, this is the same Warren Spector who built the ground of the immersive sim genre and in the future would create more than one great game in this genre, bringing his concept to perfection in Deus Ex. Richard Garriott, on the other hand, needs no introduction. This is the man who, as the son of NASA astronaut Owen Garriott, has worked with game design and created a whole series of Ultima games. Over the course of 20 years of his work, he has developed the genre of computer role-playing games and is the executive producer of Lineage and Lineage 2 games. In 2008, Richard flew into space aboard the Soyuz TMA-13 spacecraft to the International Space Station as a tourist. In short, these two were adventurous in those years, and it was they who took up the development of the idea of Neroth and Church. The team wrote a new game engine with advanced lighting and increased verticality while also marketing the game. The only downside was that Garriott hadn't allocated enough money for what it would take to produce a quality game. The project's tentative name, Underworld, stuck, and when the funding problem was resolved a year later, the game was released as Ultima Underworld, the Stygian Abyss. It was an action survival RPG from the first person. The player was wandering the underground caves and corridors and could handle the tasks in different ways. First of all, he had to understand the world. Opponents could be defeated in close combat or in ranged combat with the help of magic, or simply bypassed in stealth mode. In addition, the player had an inventory in which they could steal interactive items or craft items for themselves based on logic and life experience. And besides this, it was necessary to monitor the parameters of hunger and fatigue and look for food in various rooms, fighting for it with skeletons. It was at this moment that the idea of such games with emergent gameplay was born. What I mean is that instead of the same type of scripted situations, the player received a set of tools and mechanics to create unique gameplay, unique game tests, and tasks that the player himself chose how to solve. There was no single correct way of passing the game invented by the developers. Thus, this feature, Emergence, made it possible for random events to lead to the emergence of non-standard and interesting game situations. Take, for example, spells that were constructed from separate runestones and were not given, for example, along with a magic cane. From the runes, it was possible to assemble even combinations that were not thought out by the developers. Like in Magicka, where the players can use the trial and error method to combine whatever he wants, and instead of quickly entering the dungeon and saving the princess, the player spent hours wandering through its corridors, studying everything around it. But it was necessary to pump the character in order not to move off as the game progressed. The game was new not only in its genre, but basically became a new genre. According to Paul, this is why it was difficult for him to find a publisher at the demo stage, and for the same reason it did not become very popular after the release. Furthermore, the publisher, Origin Systems, has slashed its marketing budget. However, thanks to word of mouth and the user's attention, the game gradually became popular and reached the mark of half a million copies sold, which at that time was a confidently good result. This is where the first rules of the yet-to-be-existing immersive sim genre come into play. There's a first-person view, so that the player associates himself with the character. A believable game world, even if the game is about the Middle Ages, the player must quickly understand where he is and how everything works here. 
variability, and freedom of action. The game should not be linear, but problems should have many solutions. But the developers still had to bring all this to perfection. Riding on the way of moderate success, the studio decided to rebrand and Blue Sky became Looking Glass Studios. The team was expanded through a merger with a friend and longtime colleague of Paul Neurath, Ned Lerner. In fact, they had previously worked together creating Blue Sky, but now they decided to build a business on the principle of parallel production. The Neurath team began working on serious RPG-style games in different environments, while the Lerner team moved on to fly simulators and various sports games like the Madden series. On paper, this was supposed to help the studio be more independent financially, but in reality, it had to be tested. But it is worth noting that in 1992, the Origin Systems studio was bought by the same Electronic Arts. The revamped company set to work on a sequel to Ultima Underworld, but the game ended up being rather secondary and less successful due to bugs. Apparently, the developers themselves were tired of working on a visually monotonous project, and the team did not put the game in priority. Gradually, the team began to burn out and realized that they needed to try something new, but with the preservation of the underworld concept. Looking Glass, led by a young Doug Church, took on the development of an action-adventure video game called System Shock. In fact, it was the same corridor action RPG, only this time with an emphasis on a story-driven shooter. And instead of dungeons and magic, the plot of the game developed in the cramped walls of a spaceship with all sorts of technological features. Gadgets, implants, a combat system with an emphasis on tactical combat, and variability. If you want to fight, if you don't want to, that's okay too. The game's interface was similar to that of Underworld and worked to immerse the player. It was diegetic, all the objects and events of the game were directly inscribed in the creation. Video games, on the other hand, have many more conventions that are more difficult to explain through narrative events than in the movies as they have more levels of viewer involvement. From the soundtrack to the start menu, there are many elements in games that are not explained by their world. That is, receiving one or another diegesis signal. The player could guess that something had happened. He ended up in a new space, picked up the key, and so on. A great example of this approach is Dead Space, with its health bar on the back and holograms to provide information to the character. But the developers would not come to this immediately. But in System Shock, the player, as the main character, sees all the useful information with the help of implants. The game can be called the founder of the genre of sci-fi immersive games with shooting and an emphasis on storytelling. At the same time, it was here where the modern way of conveying information to the player arose. That was because screenwriter Austin Grossman worked in the Origin Systems team while working on the plot of Underworld. He was responsible for writing dialogues and conveying information to the player through them. But a separate dialogue box every now and then knocked the player out of the gameplay and interfered with immersion in the game. Rumor has it that while working on a new game, the developers decided to abandon the dialogue box, and Austin came up with the idea of telling all the story information in notes and audio recordings found by the player. Shutdown security is closing down on us. The elevators are frozen. Myra keeps saying that it's the cameras and the medical CPU core that should in. The very idea came to him thanks to the book Spoon River Anthology by the American poet and playwright Edgar Lee Masters. The book contained 244 poems about the lives, losses, and ways of dying of 212 individual characters living in the rural town of Spoon River. Many of the poems intersected in plot through repeated references and references which created a true and understandable picture of the community. And given that Edgar Lee was also a biographer, it was not difficult to form an image of a place with the help of people's biographies. Austin Grossman laid the foundations for the concept in which the player, being at the beginning of the game, finds himself somewhere in the abyss of events. Most of them have already happened, and all that remains is to find out what happened, and piece by piece through the records, to assemble the puzzle. We will talk about Grossman a little later. By the way, Harvey Smith managed to work on the game as a System Shock tester. In the future, he would have a big successful path cooperation with Warren Spector, and the position of creative director at Arcane Studios. But he started with a collaboration with Looking Glass. With such a creative team gathered at the beginning of 1993 to work on a project, the game simply could not fail. System Shock was somewhat similar to its progenitor in the face of Ultima Underworld, but the game had its own features. Weapons were divided by type of damage, needle, electromagnetic, tranquilizing, gas, bullet, and energy. For example, electromagnetic pulse weapons did a lot of damage to robots, but had no effect on mutants. 
Conversely, gas grenades were effective against mutants, but did not damage robots. Gadgets could give the player great advantages, but at the same time they negatively affected his character. For example, from the excessive use of patches, color perception was disturbed, and everything around was immersed in yellow-violet colors. Having pumped too many devices that feed on the character's energy, the player got tired in a few seconds. Furthermore, only a certain number of items could be carried with them, so the player had to think carefully before choosing their equipment and tactics of passing. The artificial intelligence of opponents, mutated humans and crazed robots, was advanced enough to destroy walls, move boxes, react to noises, and thus follow the player. Artificial intelligence only increased immersion in the game atmosphere. And, of course, the sound in the soundtrack was written by the talented composer and game designer Greg Lopiccolo. Initially, he was a little-known rock musician and he got into the development team by accident. Once, he just came to Looking Glass to visit a friend and was asked to help write the soundtrack. It was he who laid the idea of diegesis of sounds in the game, which helped the player navigate the narrow corridors of the spaceship. Lo Piccolo would continue his collaboration with the team in the future. Thus, in System Shock, the developers have perfected the rules of the immersive sim, adding a couple of mandatory features to them. Presenting the plot through the player's game research, which allows you to form your own opinion on the information received. Full control over the character, as the player must have similar features to impersonate with him. Well, you understand. After a not very successful game release, Looking Glass Studio went into experiments and created their most unusual game, Thief, the Dark Project, which, by the way, vaguely resembled Ultima Underworld with a gloomy atmosphere. However, this time around, the new game was based on one of the favorite types of passage by Underworld players, namely stealth. The game simply did not have action. There was no RPG and the usual survival. Because of this, the project turned out to be even anti-Ultima. Instead of dispelling the fog of war in the dungeons and cooking food with fire, the player had to instead avoid light and fire to stay safe. In Thief, the player had to pay even more attention to their surroundings and learn how to properly use it to have some benefit. After all, it was impossible to improve a character or weapon in the game. Of course, there were interactive items and gadgets in the game, but there were no stats this time. In order to be a successful sneaking thief, the player had to listen to how his steps sound on one surface or another. For example, on tile, carpet, or stone. And besides his steps, he also had to listen to the steps of opponents approaching around the corner and hide in the shadows. <laughs> Who's there? Oh. Hmm. Must have been rats. The world was the most realistic among all the projects released by the team. No magic or fantasy. Typical dirty Middle Ages. And in order to navigate this dirty Middle Age, the players had to read various signs and eavesdrop on conversations behind which the plot of the game was hidden. It meant no pointers on the map. There were no special quest markers in the game. Besides, it was necessary to periodically study the map with schematic landmarks, and the playing spaces became more spacious and varied. There was even a vertical multi-level that diversified the gameplay. But not everything went as smoothly as it seems at first glance. The budget for the development of the game was not enough, and half of the Looking Glass team since 92 has been experiencing burnout due to the work overload for six years. Because of this, part of the core team of developers left the project, including some key people in the company. In a word, the work was carried out through force, but the studio got out. The head of the development was appointed composer, already known Greg Lopiccolo. The studio looked at what Lopiccolo had contributed to System Shock, and realizing that he was more than just a composer, they entrusted him to lead the entire development of Thief. Here, his concept with sound prompts for the player shone in new splendor. For example, the guards in the castle constantly mumbled and whistled, and since the player saw everything from the first person and not from the third, which would allow them to quietly look around the corner, and the opponents were not displayed on the map, which only added realism. So these sounds were the only way to understand where the enemy was and calculate his approach. The already breakthrough artificial intelligence from System Shock and Thief has been finalized and made it even more innovative. The guards in the game moved more thoughtfully, reacted better to changes in the room, whether it be open doors or sounds made by the player, and in general were smarter than all my classmates. Except for minor bugs. The programmer, Tom Leonard, was responsible for this, who later in 2002 went to the Valve Studio and created artificial intelligence for Half-Life 2 and its episodes there. And there, he was probably canonical. Welcome. Welcome to City 17. You have chosen...
Thus, by simplifying the genre from RPG to stealth and adding a little something new to it, the team gave users a clear understanding of the game's systems that create a particular gameplay. Yes, it was like this before Thief, but now it has become clear to everyone in the immersive sim genre that the player must freely interact with the game world, its objects, and artificial intelligence. Each element of the game must have clear rules, and learning these rules one by one will make it easier for the player to figure out how to combine and use them properly. Shortly thereafter, each of the studio's games received sequels. Ultima Underworld 2 Labyrinth of Worlds in 1993, System Shock 2 in 1999, and Thief 2 The Metal Age in 2000. They were received somewhere better and somewhere worse, but they weren't particularly successful. Warren Spector, who was producing games, left the team due to disagreements. He did not like how the studio cut his Thief concept. Initially, he offered to give the player the right to choose to pass through stealth or slash from the shoulder. But we have to admit, if the developers Warren listened to him, the game would not be so special. In any case, he left, and shortly after that, Looking Glass fell apart. After leaving Looking Glass, Warren Spector moved into the studio of designer and developer John Romero, Ion Storm. The company at that time was founded quite recently, in November 1996, having signed a contract with the English parent company Eidos Interactive to release six games. Ion Storm planned to finish their games, developed by them at the companies where they worked before, to release them quickly and receive initial income. The central office of the company was set in Dallas on the 54th floor of the J.P. Morgan Chase Tower skyscraper, and its feature was a huge company logo on the floor of Italian marble. It is worth saying that they invested a lot of money in their offices. Well, Warren Spector was invited in late 1997 to found the Austin branch of Ion Storm. Things were going better in Austin than in the Dallas office. Warren has received enough resources to make his dream concept come true. I was reading Tom Clancy like everyone else on the planet, and going to see movies like Passenger 57 and Die Hard, and I just wondered to myself, why do we keep making games about orcs and elves, and the last survivor on the spaceship, and invading aliens, and only you can save the world? Warren Spector. He called the idea a troubleshooter. It was a mixture of RPG, action, stealth, with improvement and the possibility of a peaceful settlement of problems through dialogues, at the same time with a non-linear plot. He imagined the locations in the game to be quite realistic with believable physics and setting. They could be massive or they could be reduced to frighteningly narrow spaces that make the player claustrophobic. It was a mixture of all the ideas of the Looking Glass games but without the need to sweat, survive, and run into stealth. Warren wanted to show Paul Neurath and his former Looking Glass colleagues how to do essentially the same thing but make it a blockbuster adored by everyone. Former System Shock tester Harvey Smith joined the Spectre team. The screenwriter of the project was Austin Grossman, and the main producer of System Shock, Doug Church, moved to the same English company, Eidos Interactive. And it is Doug Church, as part of this company, that will publish the new War Inspector game. Doug helped with the design and technical part of the development. Well, you probably guessed what game we've been talking about all this time. Deus Ex. The game was released in 2000 on Windows, was soon ported to Mac OS, and by 2002 was released on the PlayStation 2. Deus Ex was well received by critics and became the most commercially successful game that Warren Spector, Doug Church, and their colleagues released. It is rightfully considered the benchmark of the immersive sim genre and the most advanced Warren Spector project. There is an RPG from Ultima, item management from System Shock, stealth from Thief, and all this was backed up by a non-linear plot that made it clear that the player can influence the world around them. That is, the emphasis on choice and consequence. The player saw that his actions not only affect the world around him, but also change it. The player was the most important thing that happened in the game. He created the gameplay himself. Classic example is lamb ladders, light attack munitions. They're basically hand grenades that work in three ways, but they didn't affect the player. And what happened was we had modeled them, the simulation, hear the air quotes around that word, that they were modeled as 3D objects with collision <laughs> and players stuck them to a wall and jumped up on one. And then they'd put another one higher up on the wall and jump up on it and jump up on the next one and the next one. The freedom of action and variability of Deus Ex brought it into various tops and video game halls of fame. Deus Ex was awarded excellence in game design and won major game innovation at the 2000 Game Developers Choice Awards and won in the Computer Innovation and Computer Action slash Adventure categories from the Interactive Achievement Awards. No one could have imagined a better result. 
After the closure of Looking Glass Studios, Eidos required the rights to the Thief series and commissioned Spectre's team to develop a third installment in collaboration with former Looking Glass employees. Under Spectre's leadership, the Austin office fared better than John Romero's, and after closing the main office in Dallas, Ion Storm Austin released quite successful sequels, Deus Ex Invisible War and Thief Deadly Shadows. However, after Spectre's departure for personal reasons in 2004, several other employees also left the company, but more on that later. At that moment, the studio concentrated on graphics and began to look towards the console market, which was a serious mistake for them. Deus Ex Invisible War was originally developed for the Xbox, and although the game has surpassed the original in sales to date, already at the release stage it was criticized for its design, simplified gameplay and story, and most importantly, for performance problems. The consoles at that time could not give the game a point of growth and become much more innovative. Although for the same Thief Deadly Shadows, the developers came up with their own rendering technology which made it possible to process shadows better than in Doom 3 of the same year, and it looked very cool. But for the consoles, again, we had to cut down several large locations, otherwise the consoles simply would not have pulled the game. And already at that moment, the newly born genre of immersive sim began to experience its first difficulties. Consoles literally drove it into a tight framework with all the infringements of the player's opportunities and freedom. It turned out that the bottleneck was too narrow for the genre. It was not possible to release something better and more powerful on weak consoles, as you wouldn't go far on old horses. But the funniest thing about this story is the following. Critics' ratings for both projects hovered around 80 to 85 out of 100, and you won't believe it. This was the main reason for the decline in morale in the team. They tried very hard and expected that the scores of the games would be at least at the level of the original Deus Ex, around 90. But the score of 80 literally killed the mood in the team, and the staff began to leave the team and move to other studios. As a result, in February 2005, Eidos also closed the Austin office, which marked the end of Ion Storm as a company. It is worth mentioning also another name that will be useful to us in this story. While working on Thief, the Dark Project, Ken Levine was a writer on the team for a short time. Incredibly talented game designer, who was named one of the storytellers of the decade by Game Informer in 2007, and soon you'll see why. Initially graduating from Vassar College with a Bachelor of Arts degree in drama, the young screenwriter wanted to get into the film industry and write scripts for films. He even wrote two scripts, but then he started working with games. For Thief the Dark Project, Levine came up with the initial idea. The project was then called Dark Camelot, and the main antagonists in it were King Arthur, Lancelot, and Merlin. And together with Doug Church, they worked on the concept of stealth in the game. According to Ken, the inspiration for this concept was submarine simulators, which he played a lot in his youth. There, being underwater, you had a power that you did not have on the surface, and in Thief, the player in the shadows had the same advantage. But in the end, none of this was in the game. King Arthur came a lot, didn't he? I, th I think you mean that he's associated with the court of Camelot. No, it definitely says... King Arthur came a lot. Ken Levine did not wait for the release of the game and left the Looking Glass Studios team along with a couple of other employees, Jonathan Shea and Robert Fermier. The three of them founded the Irrational Games Studio. After that, he still helped his former colleagues release System Shock 2 because, again, it was his development and his ideas which just so happened to fit perfectly into the System Shock setting. So the sequel became a collaboration between the two studios. The game retained its gloom and hardcore. It became even more difficult to survive as the weapons began to wear out, there was not enough equipment, and now it was necessary to select cartridges for a specific enemy. But there were more game mechanics, and even when choosing a character class, the player no longer needed to study the interface but had to simply select and enter the desired door. The game had many such diegetic tricks to pull the player out of the gameplay as little as possible with pop-ups, interface, and text. In a word, Ken Levine was a good storyteller, and he would prove it more than once. System Shock sold just over 50,000 copies. Well, you know, it was a complete failure. Even the first part, not the most successful, sold 170,000 copies, although at that time it was considered a competitor to the original Doom. Well, to sum up all of the above, the most successful game of the former Looking Glass developers was Deus Ex, made by John Romero's studio, Ion Storm. By the way, John Romero himself was a swindler. While his Austin company was making Deus Ex, he was in Dallas working on a Quake-powered project, Die Katana. 
Having moved from ID Software to Ion Storm, developer of the influential first-person shooters Wolfenstein 3D, Doom, and Quake, was due to release Daikatana within the next seven months. And from the very beginning of development, the game was advertised as the creation of John Romero, the man known for his work at ID Software, with the words, Everything that game designer John Romero touches turns to gore and gold. Simultaneously, the developer often went into trash talk, and the marketing of the game itself was too aggressive and offended the players. The development of Daikatana dragged on for three years and was released on the Quake 2 engine, but the saddest thing was that it was a failure. Critics defeated the long-awaited, innovative game because of which the collapse in the company began. The offices were in conflict with each other, and partially it also influenced the closure of the first and later the second branch of Ion Storm. And while some companies closed and their employees went to other companies, which would also close over time, the young French developer Raphael Calantonio worked at Electronic Arts. If you remember, they bought Origin Systems with its Ultima series. So, when Colantonio was about 18 years old on the verge of military service, which was compulsory at that time in France, he entered the competition held by Electronic Arts for knowledge of the game series Ultima, which he was a fan of. He did not know that the competition was intended to find suitable candidates for a new studio that Electronic Arts was opening in France. So, in 1989, thanks to the competition for the Ultima series of games, Colantonio was hired by Electronic Arts. However, with the popularization of home video game consoles, Electronic Arts began a shift towards sports-oriented games, and Colantonio was not particularly interested in this area, so he left the company. Around 1999, he decided to open his own studio, and with the financial support of his uncle, he and his three friends founded Arcane Studios in Lyon. The things you do to make a continuation of your favorite Ultima Underworld. The author of the original game, Paul Neareth, was behind the development of Underworld 3, but the rights to the series belonged to Electronic Arts. Electronic Arts said they were not interested in Colantonio's concept as it was proposed, but that they would share the rights to the series if Colantonio allowed them to interfere in the development process and accept their radical changes. Of course, this did not suit him because he wanted to lead the development himself. Colantonio and his team had to remake the upcoming game, placing it in their own universe no longer connected to Ultima. So, in 2002, a project very much reminiscent, but taking place outside the universe of Ultima games, Arx Fatalis, was born. The game had the same emphasis on RPGs and survival, work with the interface and items, stealth like in Thief, and even the opportunity to win money in Roulette, and besides, there were fighting games with swords and rune magic which the player had to use himself by drawing spells with the mouse. Something is wrong. The development of Arx Fatalis depleted the studio's financial reserves. It was on the verge of bankruptcy, and only at the last moment Colantonio managed to sign an agreement with the publisher Joe Wu Yi Entertainment. But the game still sold poorly and failed commercially. That was accompanied by uncorrected bugs and strong competitors. The Elder Scrolls III Morrowind was literally a month and a half ahead of Colantonio's project and took all the laurels. But in fairness, it's worth saying that its developer, Bethesda Game Studios, will merge work with Arcane Studios in the future. For Bethesda itself, Morrowind was also a breakthrough. The studio was founded in 2001, and at the same time Bethesda Softworks and Bethesda Game Studios split into a publisher and developer. In the very next year, Todd, Bro Guy Howard, released Morrowind, earning critical and commercial success and winning several Game of the Year awards. As a result, by the mid-2000s, the immersive sim genre had passed its peak and was approaching a crisis. And perhaps here is the best moment to take a short pause, eat Twix, and think. Why were they so interesting and innovative, but such a failure financially? Why didn't these games succeed? First of all, high production rates. You may not have noticed, but all of the above projects came out in just 10 years and all had a hand in the former Looking Glass developers. The same people released a game a year, which was just an unrealistic pace. Today, the aforementioned Todd Howard can sell the same Skyrim for 10 years and all this time while sitting on the couch and developing The Elder Scrolls VI, and then people really burned out from the speed and volume of work which was accompanied by the release of new consoles and technologies. And if you remember, the Looking Glass studio simultaneously released sports games and simulations to somehow distract and earn money. Actually, for this reason, many games were either transferred to be completed or came out raw and crooked. 
After the game release, they are supported for some time, ported to new consoles, bugs are fixed, and so on. So here is System Shock 2, which was made in just a year and a half. In order to be released on time, it was written on the ready-made Thief engine with which the developers were not familiar. Therefore, they corrected errors as they were identified. Well, after the failure of the game on release, support for System Shock 2 was turned off the very next year. It had a lot of unfixed bugs and it was not supported at all on fresh Windows XP for a long time. Another problem for the developers was constant miscalculations in planning, available resources, and ambitions. No matter how cool the idea is, in order to implement it you need to calculate everything, find finances, and even this is not enough because it can take a lot of time to rewrite the code or fix bugs. It is for this reason that Thief the Dark Project turned out to be such a cool stealth game. At some point, the developers realized that they were not succeeding in abandoning the already written combat mechanics and levels. And the successful Deus Ex was originally a 500-page design document which was cut in half only after reviews from colleagues from other studios. Furthermore, developers were constantly pressed by competitors. Not only System Shock competed with Doom, Ultima competed with Wolfenstein 3D. Users chose games that came out earlier than others and were more cheerful, more action-packed, or understandable. And since immersive sims did not focus on any one element of the gameplay, they often had very crooked shooting. In a word, the innovative games of different studios were not lucky to come out simultaneously because they had to literally fight for the audience, tearing it apart. They tried to increase the game's sales with dynamic trailers, but the same thief was a little different and it could hardly be called a dynamic game. People were simply misled. The creator of Deus Ex, Warren Spector, believed that a good idea and something innovative was important for a game. The genre is not important for the marketability of the game. So, in an interview, he said the following. So many business models and ways to reach an audience that you can do anything. People are doing anything. There's room for single-player narrative games. There's room for immersive sims. There's room for completely linear, I think you should just go make a movie games. There's room for multiplayer sandbox games and battle royales, four-player co-op games. There's room for everything. And it's not that everything makes the same amount of money, but it's possible to make money with anything, which means it's possible to make another one, which is, in terms of success criteria, Selling enough copies to make your next one is maybe the most important. That is possible regardless of genre, regardless of game style, regardless of team size, budget. Paradoxically, the location of the camera also affected the game's sales. Our eye is accustomed to a cinematic picture, and a third-person game is still more cinematic than a first-person game because the player can see the character, that is, your ratio within the environment. It is interesting to observe what the character does when pressing the keys. His emotions are visible on his face. His appearance and design attracts. And when the game takes place in the first person, one of the channels of perception seems to disappear from you. We can conclude that in those years, running with a shotgun in Doom was easier and more fun than dealing with crafting in Ultima. Gameplay Half-Life seemed much more attractive and spectacular than any system shock. However, it was still nice in immersive sims to find your own way of passing through some moment of the game, to find inconspicuous clues, ventilation tunnels to cut off the path, silently eliminate opponents so as not to fight one against five. And it's a shame to admit it, but Warren Spector hasn't done anything better since Deus Ex, and hasn't even repeated the same success. And all of the above led to the fact that immersive games disappeared for some time from the attention of the gaming community. The year 2007 has come, and with the release of one project, the world of immersive games has received a second wind. As we remember, Ken Levine, who left Looking Glass Studios before the release of System Shock 2, created his own studio. To cut a long story short, between 2007 and 2009, Irrational Games was called 2K Boston and 2K Australia as part of 2K Games, but it didn't last long and the team returned to Irrational Games, so we won't pay too much attention to that. And in 2007, Ken Levine and his new studio introduced the world to the ideological heir to his last game, Bioshock. The idea for Bioshock came from um, a bunch of places. I mean, the, the, we had a, there's two components, sort of like, what is the game you want to make? And then what are the thematic and narrative elements? The story wasn't there at the beginning. We always, it was always like a Robinson Crusoe story. It was always a castaway story. One of our goals was in Bioshock is always that the narrative and the gameplay elements would, would, that would have unity. 
The game designer read The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand and was so inspired by the book and the philosophy of its characters that he decided to take this idealized world and turn it upside down to see what would happen if something went wrong in it. And while walking along the Rockefeller Center, he decided why not make the whole city in a similar Art Deco style, but underwater. A kind of dystopian world of George Orwell. And this idea with water created a whole space for creativity. Mechanics with the study of opponents migrated to the game, which made it possible to know their critical places and inflict more damage. For this, it was enough to take a picture of the enemy. Psy abilities and action shooters with adventures perfectly fit into this mechanical Steam world. Well, considering that technology has stepped forward over time, the release of the game on consoles did not need additional dances with tambourines and was not a failure. As a result, the game was released on both the Xbox 360 and Windows, was eventually ported to the PlayStation 3, and later went through another series of re-releases on all modern consoles. Bioshock was extremely positively received by critics and sold 3 million copies in two years, which made the game quite successful. This allowed Bioshock to expand into a series of successful projects and even influence the games of other studios by showing how to make the in-game interface user-friendly. Take at least the same Dead Space or Dishonored. Simultaneously, the guys from Arcane Studios did not sit idly by, and after the failed Arx Fatalis, they released the first-person action role-playing game Dark Messiah of Might and Magic, where the player was first provided with an advanced combat system with the ability to interact with the environment during the fight. The game even had a multiplayer mode where either the player could participate in a 1v1 gladiator fight or two teams with five player classes fought on a large map, if you think it was something like this. then you are not wrong. It really was spectacular. Only now, Arx Fatalis has already been forgotten by everyone, and the game had little in common with Might and Magic, so the fans of the series bypassed this project. Later in an interview, game designer Rafael Colantonio admitted that hardcore Might and Magic fans just made the developers look like shit because they didn't want this kind of game, and people who weren't familiar with the Might and Magic series didn't even look at the game. Well, Critics crushed the game due to the lack of some interesting plot and atmosphere familiar to the series. Die. Of course, among a rather narrow audience of fans of the game, it became a cult classic, but they forgot about it pretty quickly. Arcane Studios has moved on to other projects like the 2009 mobile game Karma Star for iOS or the cancelled shooters The Crossing and Half-Life 2 Episode 4. Yes, at some point Gabe stated that after releasing three main episodes that continued the story of Half-Life 2, a fourth episode was planned which would have its own separate storyline and would be developed outside of Valve. But as you know, even the third did not come out. What's the point in developing the fourth? So Arkane Studios thought the same thing and concentrated on a new game. Second director Harvey Smith joined Colantonio's development team and the company took on the development of immersive games about a silent stealth killer. At the same time, stealth this time was not a hardcore and mandatory style of passing. In the game, you could run around and kill everyone around with many unusual abilities. There were six active abilities, four passive abilities or enhancements, and 40 bone charms that gave the player supernatural privileges. Finally, in 2012, the now legendary Dishonored saw the world. A first-person adventure game with a focus on stealth action, using gadgets and the environment to destroy opponents. The world in the game was a series of self-contained mission-oriented zones for varied gameplay. Between missions, the player was taken to a central hub, the Hound Pits Pub, where the player's character Corvo could meet up with their allies, receive mission briefings in alternate targets, and convert collected loot into new equipment and upgrades. By the way, remember Austin Grossman with his innovative note idea? So he is behind all the abundance of notes in the first and second parts of the game of the Dishonored series. He co-wrote these Arcane Studios games. Bioshock and Dishonored had a lot in common, but Deus Ex Human Revolution, released a year earlier, was different. 
Although in general all three games were developed by different studios, Deus Ex Human Revolution was rather quiet, and generally based on the canonical first part, both in terms of meaning and gameplay. Yes, some features like the wound system were abolished in the sequel, but the graphics have evolved over the years like a monkey into a man. The design has become more attractive and clearer. It was a worthy continuation of the series. After the mediocre spin-off Deus Ex The Fall, which was released first on iOS in 2013 and the following year on Android and Windows, the fourth full-fledged part of the series, Deus Ex Mankind Divided, was released in 2016. But the developers of the series were pursued by failure after failure. First, during development, information about the game was leaked. The team then failed the pre-order. The Augment Your Pre-Order program meant the developers were supposed to release the game four days earlier at a certain level of pre-orders, but it was closed due to indignation of the players, and all bonuses except for the early release were included in the regular pre-order. Well, the icing on the cake was the six months postponement of the game release. Deus Ex Mankind Divided was too unfinished. As a result, Warren Spector, the author of the original, praised the project but negatively reacted to the abundance of violence in the game because, quote, Deus Ex never put murder at the forefront. Critics also rated the game highly enough, but Square Enix turned the franchise down. Sales were unsatisfactory for a sequel. It's hard to say what they expected, but only in May 2022, the total sales of Deus Ex Human Revolution, Deus Ex Human Revolution Director's Cut, and Deus Ex Mankind Divided exceeded 12 million copies. Problems with sales of immersive games also affected other studios. It seemed that the genre had just begun to revive again. Several high-profile titles came out at once. Bioshock Infinite broke the sales record of the original series in half a year and sold 11 million copies in two years. But no. Deus Ex Mankind Divided only reached that sales figure in 2022. Developers Eidos Interactive Corporation have taken on third-person superhero action games like the Guardians of the Galaxy games, and Kevin Levine's new game was stuck in production hell, and he was always changing something in the project, thereby annoying the team. And Dishonored 2 didn't repeat the financial success of the original. And the very next year, 2017, Arcane Studios, together with Bethesda Softworks, released Prey, which actually became the studio's swan song in the immersive sim genre. Initially, the game was conceived as another rethinking and spiritual continuation of System Shock. At the same time, the studio provided the player with several potential ways to progress through the game, and considered the Talos 1 in-game station as a rethinking of the idea of their own dungeon from Arx Fatalis. It is worth noting that Prey had a not-so-successful eponymous progenitor in 2006, but when its sequel was being prepared, the rights to it were transferred to Bethesda, and the resulting game didn't use any of the assets of the planned sequel and included only the title of the previous game and the general theme of the protagonist being hunted by aliens, and then in a different way. The game came out just great, with interesting gameplay and excellent reviews from critics. It is recognized as one of the best games of 2017 by several popular publications, but for some reason, sales of the game have not taken off since the release. This overshadowed the developers and cast doubt on the release of the planned sequel. If you try to find some explanation for its failure, then there may be several reasons. In short, the game was too good. Even too much. It became oversaturated. The developers tried so hard to bring it to the ideal that they got confused about how they wanted to see it. And because of this, the game had several problems, among which the most obvious was not a perfect immersive sim. After a while, the developers themselves were convinced of this. According to Colantonio, You know, is it too long? As, as we, have we lost the player at this point? Like, are, is the player still thinking about like the overall motive or, or is the player lost into like why they're doing the thing they're doing right now, you know? So it's a very, very iterative process, uh, and which can be uh, very distressing to uh, business people who are trying to uh, guide us and, <laughs> and wait for the game to come out, like not understanding why this thing is so hard to make. After all, you've already done it 10 times. What is the problem? Besides, according to him, Bethesda insisted for nothing on being tied to the old name Prey, which scared the players away. The developers originally wanted to name the game differently, but Colantonio had to lie to reporters that he was happy with such a name, only recently admitted that he originally wanted to apologize to the authors of the original Prey and explain that he did not want to steal their intellectual property, but he didn't know its developers and therefore couldn't contact them. Backtracking in the game was annoying due to the constant respawning of enemies in locations after they were destroyed. What was the point then? 
wasting supplies on them. Furthermore, the principle of immersive play as you want was violated. Constant stealth did not work, and you didn't get enough pockets for all the goodies. There were so many items available for processing into supplies and equipment that the game forced you to regularly return to the processing terminal. The focus in the game has shifted, and the developers have failed to give players the motivation to play the game in all available ways and use all the features. One of the game's lead designers, Ricardo Bear, admitted in an interview. There's lots of things I could critique about Prey, but I think probably we should have been a little more um, aggressive and cutting some features from the game so that it was a little, uh, so we could go deeper on the things that we, you know, fewer things. Uh, game length is a weird thing because you've got one camp of people that are like, I want a game that says it's got 2,000 hours of gameplay. Right. But then on the other hand, I'm over here like, okay, I don't want to be done with this game in three hours. It's an RPG. I want to, I want to mess around. I want to have, to have a cool story and a big world to explore. But I'm also 43 and I've got five yes. kids and like, I want to finish the game. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't want it to last 300 hours. Like. According to him, the players probably had too many abilities and the developers probably went crazy creating them. Their number should be narrowed down. Not every player needs to see every ounce of content in the game. At the same time, a kind of return threshold from the invested funds was shameful. The developer realized that they made about 90 abilities in the game and the players saw only three of them. Maybe if there was less choice, it would be better. Well, since we're talking about forces, it's worth mentioning that the work of Arcane Studios was parallelized and was carried out in two offices, Arcane Lion and Arcane Austin. The first was led by Rafael Calantonio and the second by Harvey Smith, and they initially worked together on Dishonored. The studios then divided the work as Looking Glass Studios had done earlier, with Harvey Smith now continuing to make Dishonored 2 while the Colantonio team was developing Prey. Sometimes they exchanged new developments and experiences, but still concentrated on their own projects, which caused them to burn out a lot. Most likely the game was planned even more ambitiously and was drawn to a whole series of similar games. For example, the idea with mimics that the players could turn into any object. It's just that there wasn't enough time and resources for revision, and after the sales failure, all the development of the continuation was completely abandoned. Rafael Colantonio decided to spend more time with his family and children, so he entrusted the management of Arcane Studios to Harvey Smith and left the company. He admitted that he hated to lie and the situation with Bethesda and Prey contributed to his departure, as he felt that he, quote, no longer manages his own ship. In Arcane, in his opinion, the processes began to resemble the creation of a product and not a creative work. The game designer moved into indie development, which required less effort and had less pressure from the outside, which allowed him to bring the game to the ideal. Two years later, the developer announced an action RPG with elements of immersive sim and a top-down view called Weird West and he calmly made it for the next three years until the spring of 2022. The game turned out to be not perfect, but still very good and atmospheric. The advantages of Weird West were well-developed characters, an interesting plot and dialogues, a deep gameplay system. But the morality system, chaotic stealth, combat, and camera work in the game sagged and sometimes created game difficulties. I track that man, I find that man, I kill that man. After I've killed him, I transport that man. Meanwhile, Arcane were forced to help Bethesda Softworks develop Wolfenstein Youngblood. The game came out average. Critics rated it with restraint, saying that it was inferior to the previous part of Wolfenstein II, The New Colossus. It was not immersive, so for a while, the immersive genre died again. In 2021, the studio released Deathloop, a shooter that, again, had little to do with immersive games, and in general, it's hard to say what it had with since the marketing game was incorrectly presented to the players. Everyone thought it was some kind of multiplayer online shooter or battle royale, when in fact the game was hiding a fascinating concept with a time loop. In a word, it was a typical action game from Arcane. The player took on the role of an assassin stuck in a time loop tasked with taking out eight targets called Visionaries on Black Reef Island before midnight. Leaving at least one alive will reset the time loop and undo the work done. If the player dies before destroying eight targets, he will wake up again at the beginning of the cycle. In this case, the player could use a combination of stealth, parkour, offensive skills, use weapons, gadgets, and abilities, as in Dishonored and Prey. The critics were delighted, but players did not immediately pay attention to the project. Some argued that the time loop itself was added to the game on purpose to stretch too short gameplay and save on it. 
Many completely bypassed Deathloop, which is why its sales did not reach the possible maximum. But it's worth pointing out that Arkane's idea of asymmetric multiplayer could just be the first foray into future multiplayer games. The idea itself is not new because 10 years ago, the studio canceled the development of The Crossing, remember? So The Crossing was a shooter with asymmetric multiplayer in which the Templars fought with swords against the Commandos. Well, if you skip the fact that the Commandos had modern weapons instead of swords. And if it seems that Arcane Studios, with all their marketing hacks, is just a tiny bit short of a full-fledged first-class immersive sim project that will make them a big and successful studio, then things have been something like this. Mm. First time. In the spring of 2023, Arcane Studios, along with Bethesda, became part of a large deal in which Microsoft became the property. In parallel with this, their first-person shooter Redfall came out with co-op and multiplayer, and then they knocked from the bottom. The ratings and reviews for the game were the worst in the history of the studio. The game was released with so many bugs that it seemed to be only half completed. To get to the mission, the player was forced to run across the entire map. There was not enough transport in the game, although it basically stood on the street. In addition, the locations in the game were almost empty, and the heroes had one and a half abilities for four. One of them was invisibility just invisibility instead of shadow stealth like before, facial stagnation, and if the player died during the task then he would be teleported to the starting point. There was no save in the game. As well as some kind of narrative, there was simply no story in Redfall. It seemed that Bethesda Softworks had finally spoiled the once successful Arcane Studios. There was nowhere to fall below, and if they don't release something worthwhile, then we definitely won't see the old company anymore. Meanwhile, the grandfathers of the genre are not going to retire yet. Paul Neurath and Warren Spector set up Other Side Entertainment in Boston in 2013. A couple of years later, Spector headed the second office of the studio. Where do you think? That's right, in Austin. Well, together, they continued to develop games that they liked, so in 2018, the first-person action role-playing game Underworld Ascendant was released which became the sequel to Ultima Underworld Distigian Abyss and Ultima Underworld 2 Labyrinth of Worlds. Building on the original games and years of experience, the developers have re-emphasized non-linear development, simulated systems, and emergent gameplay. Again, there was stealth, with switching off lanterns and hide-and-seek, and the spirit of Thief. Again, runic magic. The game was developed as an indie because the budget for it was collected by a Kickstarter from the fans, but they just didn't like it. At the release, the players received bugs, uncomfortable and, moreover, buggy controls in a rather strange setting and locations. In fact, because of this, no one liked the game. The developers decided to fix the entire level design with patches, but with the exception for the most devoted fans, the game never went to anyone. It was boring and had no single idea. A big sandbox for grown-up boys. Interestingly, the project was based on a 500-page document. It's scary to even imagine how much the developers stuffed into the game, which as a result never came in handy for the player. Perhaps if the company had an experienced producer who would have directed the development in the right direction, the game would have turned out better. The only thing that kept the project from failure was the lack of analogs or competitors. Furthermore, in 2016, Other Side Entertainment took on the development of System Shock 3. Warren Spector, who worked on the first System Shock, took on the sequel, and in the spring of the following year, the studio entered into a partnership agreement with Starbreeze, which was supposed to help release the third part of the game. In 2019, publisher Starbreeze dropped the publishing rights to the game, despite the game being half-finished. Development continued until the studio ran into funding problems the following spring. Other side entertainment was forced to cut developers. Twelve employees left the company, and among them, some of the leaders. In May 2020, the creators of System Shock 3 announced that the Chinese giant Tencent would now develop the franchise. The development was stopped, and the rights to the third and fourth parts of System Shock were transferred to a Chinese company. In an interview with GamesBeat, the producer of the original System Shock, Warren Spector, said that the third part of the series, which was being worked on in the dungeons of Other Side Entertainment, is essentially already dead. The franchise is in the hands of Tencent, and it is up to the Chinese company to decide how to manage it. Spectre is happy with this turn of events and believes that, quote, it will be better for everyone. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. However, do not rush to get upset. Even if this is true and the third part of the game does not come out from other side entertainment, this is not so bad. 
Most likely, the studio itself would not have pulled such a large project and something would have come out at the level of Underworld Ascendant. So, it remains to be hoped that Tencent will not abandon the project and sooner or later the game will be released. Besides, Night Dive Studios has been working on a remake of the original System Shock since 2015, and in May 2023, the studio released a completely redesigned game on the modern Unreal Engine 4. Night Dive Studios step-by-step -step picked up the rights to the first part, the second, and then to the franchise itself. After a successful Kickstarter campaign that raised over $1 million, the game went through a long development cycle of almost eight years, which was delayed and interrupted several times. Either due to the switch to Unreal Engine or the idea of reworking the original to the smallest detail was too ambitious and required restarting the development of the game from scratch. As a result, in order not to oversaturate the player with features, the game was instead focused on being a faithful remake and delivering on the team's original Kickstarter promises. Hey, I can't wait to return to that world. I, I forgot <laughs> right? that basically the right? fans know way more about the game than I do now, so it'll be a new experience for me too. And Night Dive Studios succeeded, despite the fact that the developers had never made a major project from scratch, but were exclusively engaged in re-releases. Although they weren't the original creators of the Shock systems, but they managed to convey the original as accurately as possible. In some places, even too much. Not only its spirit, but all its features. All mechanics, plot, and gameplay remained canonical. The only thing that had changed was the graphics, thanks to which the game now looked juicy, modern, and of high quality. And most importantly, it was very similar stylistically and did not make a completely different game out of the remake. Well, they added a monetary and financial system, which was not in the original. Now, with the help of special receivers in the game, you could recycle absolutely anything and use the proceeds to buy consumables, food, and weapon upgrades. But usually these receivers were not often found, but only a couple times on each deck. Yes, perhaps this is the best way to experience System Shock today, both for the oldies and especially for the generation not familiar with the original game. And it seems that the circle has closed. Just as System Shock was an almost perfect immersive about 30 years ago, today it is the most prominent representative of this genre. In summary, what do we have today? Has the genre survived its best years and now the patient is more dead than alive? More or less large studios left to deal with other game genres. The genre founders switched to indie development or completely disintegrated. Many immersive mechanics and approaches have been successfully picked up and adapted by other developers. Let the fans of hardcore immersive games forgive us, but look at Kingdom Come Deliverance or even Cyberpunk 2077, how much of the immersive genre they have. Of course, this does not apply to the entire game, but in some places, the real deus ex takes place in the game. And then there's The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion or Stalker or The Occupation, Pathologic 2, Bioshock Infinite, Fallout 3, Hitman, even The Long Dark, Rust, Green Hell, and a bunch of other survival games that use the mechanics of immersive sims, developing them even more advanced than the immersive sims themselves. For some reason, no one is looking at this, but it continues to shout that the genre of immersive simulators is dead. Deep immersive simulations have had a huge impact on other games and the gaming industry in general. At the same time, they were not sufficiently improved and not brought to gaming perfection. They were not always clear to the players, they were not always attractive, therefore they were often ignored by a wide audience. Analyzing the course of history, the question arises, why exactly were immersive sims created? To teach other studios and developers how to make interesting games? To transfer your rich inner world game mechanics and experience to more attractive and understandable projects and then die? Or to be reborn again with fresh ideas already in indie development? For example, there's an indie project inspired by Thief called Gloomwood. This is a full-fledged stealth game with immersive elements where even the assets and some game mechanics seem to be taken by fans directly from the original Thief. Only the setting here is similar to Bloodborne, and the essence of the game is survival. The player explores the map in separate areas, finds keys, and starts generators to go further. Stealth here is focused not on avoiding enemies but on stealth kills, as in Dishonored. Supplies and ammo are scarce. At the same time, inconspicuous murders are quite hardcore. Everything is tied to timing. If you don't have time, you can get caught by patrolmen. The mechanics with light are one of the main ones in the game, but the developers have also created absolutely gloomy locations where on the contrary, you have to use light to find a way out, otherwise you'll be eaten. Must be one of them talking dolls. Oh yeah? Ever have a talking doll rip out your voice box? <laughs>
<laughs> At the same time, opponents can talk and make themselves known in advance. Thanks to all this, the game has a good balance between stealth and horror system shock. Another indie development is Never Looted Dungeon. It's kind of like the successor to Ultima Underworld in a dungeon with very advanced physics. The player is forced to look for solutions to avoid traps and sometimes fight opponents. The design and interactivity of items is amazing. The player can pick up almost any item and find some use for it. The main thing is to be careful because traps are very unexpected and unpredictable. The game is somewhat reminiscent of Underworld Ascendant, only simpler, visually pleasing, and refined. And if you want to play a comic about gangsters, there is one among indie immersive projects. Fallen Aces is a first-person crime noir game set in the aesthetics of a 90s pseudo 3D shooter. And the visual style here, although comical, is quite catchy. So far, the project is available in the demo, but it's already interesting to see what happens when it comes out. The player must save the beauty from the intruders who are teeming with the streets and game levels. Well, there are many ways to eliminate intruders, as befits immersive sims. If you want, you can fight. If you want, you can go around stealthily or throw them with street garbage and additional objects. You can even lure opponents into a trap. In a word, noir fans should take a closer look at the game. Floor. Be careful. Is <laughs> automatics. And the most interesting representative today seems to be Shadows of Doubt, an immersive sandbox detective stealth game set in a fully simulated sci-fi noir city of crime and corruption. This is how the immersive genre was supposed to be reborn, with a minimum emphasis on action during the passage and a maximum player's involvement in thinking and hardcore. The scale of the concept is astonishing, and it seems that today no major studio is able to release such a AAA project. This is probably the first game made as Warren Spector bequeathed and that the game designer could not implement in Deus Ex. Even six years ago, he voiced how his dream idea would sound, for which no publishing house would give money. Called the, the one, block, one block role playing game, where it's kind of the opposite of an open world game, which is typically, you know, miles wide and an inch deep. Mm. Uh, and what I want to do is just the opposite. I want to do a game that simulates one city block, just one block, you know, um, with businesses and, you know, put a hotel on it and simulate it within an inch of its life, have a bunch of people, a bunch of characters there who all have their own stories, um, focus on non-combat AI, you know, do d the one block role play game. I would kill to do that. So, in Shadows of Doubt, the player is a detective who investigates various murders in a small city the size of a block, and each inhabitant lives his own life in it. He has a home, job, families, hobbies, well, just like you and me. And the player explores all this in order to make a logical chain from the clues and solve the crime. And the missions and the city are created procedurally, so the game turns into a real sandbox with many unusual situations. So unusual that the player can be at the scene of the crime before the crime itself and before the killer, thereby preventing it. And wrong decisions can lead to unpredictable consequences in the future. In Shadows of Doubt, there is no clearly defined plot and a lot of meta-narrative. The player thinks out the plot and generates it in front of him. All items in the game are interactive and can be somehow involved. The camera in the game is in first person, and although the game is a bit compressed into the detective framework, this is a real immersive sim focused on the player character and his decisions, starting with all possible options to open the door and ending with polls of characters. The game is hardcore enough for fans of this kind of gameplay, but not tedious. Here you can spend an hour searching one room for clues and not find anything useful, so if you're tired of this, the game may not be for you. However, this is how life works, which does not always please us with a candy for the work done. In that regard, Shadows of Doubt is one of the best immersive sims of all time. And do not look at the cubic graphics in the spirit of Minecraft. You need powerful hardware for the game, because during the game the computer heats up so that it can heat the apartment in winter. Obviously, the amount of information and variables processed during the gameplay is simply enormous. And that's another reason why it's so hard to make a good AAA immersive sim project. All the power of next-gen consoles and computers will be spent on processing tons of information, and not on cinematic graphics, as many thought before. Summing it up, I would like to say that the genre of immersive sims has come a long way for 30 years and is not going to die. It spawned many new genres, came up with many game mechanics, and gave the world several almost immortal titles. And it looks like its future lies with indie developers and projects like Shadows of Doubt. 
And if developers don't have to follow the lead of studios or people with money, don't have to chase trends and try to create a game that is easy to sell in order to make a lot of money, then everything will be fine with immersive sims. After all, in the end, do not forget how the same Warren Spector once said, I'd rather do something that's an inch wide and a mile deep than something that's a mile wide and an inch deep. Warren Spector If you enjoyed this video, please like it and subscribe to our channel. We try to talk about games with soul and make our videos a mile deep. We wonder how this or that game gave birth to a whole genre and also analyze the history of everyone's favorite game series. Subscribe so you don't miss new videos. Thank you for watching this video to the end. It was Press X. See you soon.